first reading was from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the houses of Israel and the houses of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and then I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and that they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their inequity and remember the sins no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So at least in Lutheran churches, every year on the last Sunday of October, we celebrate Reformation Sunday because it is the closest Sunday in October, October 31st, the day that Luther posted the 95 Theses on the church door in Whitworth. The 95 Theses are things that most Lutherans have probably not heard of and even fewer of us have probably read them. But what they were, were what we would today call debate points. Even though lots of us think, like to think about Luther as this kind of backwater monk who lived out in the forest someplace, he was in fact a university professor. And what he was doing was inviting people to a debate and discussion. And the 95 Theses were points that people would debate and discuss about what it meant to really be a follower of Jesus. Of course, that discussion ended up setting off a firestorm. <clears throat> Luther was messing with a system which had not only religious, but also political, financial, and social ramifications for all kinds of people, both inside and outside the church. And so today, even though we probably only remember the 95 Theses as things that started a big fight, what they really were were discussion points about what the Christian faith was supposed to be all about. And in fact, <coughs> The 95 Theses set off the Reformation because they invited discussion about faith that touched on real life. Christian faith for Luther and the Reformers wasn't just reflecting on how we get promised heaven sometime after we die. Rather, it was an understanding of God as a living force in our lives, right here and right now, and it was supposed to change how we live our lives each and every day. And finally, that is what faith is all about. It's about having a real, living relationship with God. It's about having a living relationship right now with God, not just sometime after you die. And it's about feeling a connection to God that changes who you are and how you live each day. That was also the vision that Jeremiah had in today's first reading. The covenant that God made with people was supposed to be a covenant of faith, an expression of a real and living relationship people have with a real and living God. And that's what Jeremiah says God is always about doing in each and every age. And yet in Jeremiah's day, and in Luther's day, and in our own, people easily substitute religion for faith. And what I mean by that is that people often, instead of thinking of faith as a living relationship with God, try to reduce that relationship to a set of intellectual doctrines and ideas. You know, stuff that we're supposed to acknowledge about God. And sometimes we judge one another by whether we've got our facts straight or not. And Lutheran churches in particular are guilty for centuries of using this day to say, we're right, everybody else is wrong. That's not what faith is all about. It's easy for many people to reduce a relationship with God to a code of morality where we're supposed to be about doing good things, living in the right way, whether it's for ourselves, our society, or just teaching our kids right from wrong. And we get in big battles with each other over what right and wrong means, and we use God as a way to justify our own sense of what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes we reduce our relationship with God to simply a social program. We're supposed to do good, and be concerned about society. We're proud of helping the poor and those who are less fortunate, and yet we all know lots of people 
who do those things and care about others who don't believe in God. And if that's all faith is about, who needs God? Now, of course, there is nothing wrong with good theology or morality or social consciousness. But all of those actions for people of faith are supposed to be something that springs forth from that core of a living, real relationship with God. That's the hub that holds everything else together. And if we don't have that, everything else starts to fall apart. And it falls apart because it keeps us from making faith and our relationship with God the center. And instead, what can happen is if, if it's just a bunch of ideas and doctrines that is the center of my relationship with God, then I make God into my own image instead of being formed into God's image. Because I think about the things that seem logical to me that this is right about God. <coughs> Amazingly, when I do that, God turns out to be just like me. And it's easy for me to just think God is like me instead of being challenged to be more like God. If God is simply a moral code, then I substitute my own sense of morality and think that it's more important than humility and forgiveness. Because again, I think about all the things that are important to me and I decide those must be important to God and say, I'm really good, I don't need forgiveness. But you notice that in the first reading today, Jeremiah says that when people are living in that right relationship with God, he doesn't say, then they won't need forgiveness anymore because they will be perfect people. Instead, he says, they're going to be forgiven and God's going to remember their iniquity no more because they live in that relationship of trust and they don't have to pretend anymore. And if I let God and the relationship with God simply become a kind of a program where I'm helping others, then it's easy for me to let my own good works become the goal of faith instead of understanding that everything I do and every opportunity I have is an opportunity for me to be God's living hands and living presence in the light of the world. So the reason that we celebrate Reformation every year is not to celebrate Martin Luther or the correctness of our own theology. Rather, it's to be reminded that in every age and in every place, we need to consciously focus on deepening our living relationship with God in our real, everyday lives. It is not enough to simply say, well, we come to church and we live good lives and we help others whenever we can. Without a real, meaningful, living relationship with God, everything else falls apart. We need those kinds of discussions that Luther started to be able to keep us focused on what it means to actually have a real and living relationship with God. And it's one of the reasons that I'm glad that as part of our confirmation program, all of our confirmants every year, even though they complain that they're, I don't want to do it, I can't do it, they all do. They all write a faith statement. And what we're looking for in those faith statements is not deep theology that explains everything there is to say about God. It's rather a reflection each one of them has had about where is God in my real life? Who are the people? What are the situations? <laughs> What, what were the times when I felt God moving in my life? How was I God's hands in somebody else's life? How am I wrestling with who God is in my real everyday life? That is an important conversation we all need to have. It's an important conversation even if everybody doesn't read them. But we asked a few people to read them, and three of our kids are going to read them in just a minute, and it's great. And the reason that we ask folks to read them in church is not simply to say how great and cool these ninth graders are. They are. And it's not to do what the usual reaction of most adults is, is to say either one of two things. Either, I'm so glad that's not me up there, or I'm glad they didn't make, the, make me do this when I was confirmed. It's so that in listening to their stories and their struggles and their wrestling with faith, we can continue to have those conversations ourselves and go, oh, you know, I wonder if God is working in my life in that way too, or in ways similar to that. Or how is God really moving in my life, and what does it mean to me? That's how we keep faith real in our lives. It's also why I'm beginning the Theology on Tap program, because I could have just said, well, I'll lead another Bible study, but sometimes when you lead a Bible study, it becomes about the book, instead of about my real life in a place outside of the church, where I have to experience and live my faith in the real world. And that's the kind of conversation we always need to have. 
Because in the end, the center of who we are as people of faith has to be our living relationship with a living God, not what we do or think or feel because of that relationship. That's what Reformation is all about. It's why we need Reformation in every age, even today. And so as we continue to think about Reformation and how God is working in our lives, I'm going to invite some of our ninth graders to come and read that, read their faith statements for us and to inspire in us some of those conversations as well.